And then has Matt Harvey reported, and are you looking at him strictly as a starter at this point, or can you see a scenario where maybe he transitions to like bullpen swingman type role? Well, he's still going through the process of, of taking this physical. That should be wrapped up any, any, any day now. Um, and then with the, when, when he gets here from on, on the field standpoint, I, I think we're just going to see what we have and, and see how he looks. I think we're keeping our options open with them, whether it's rotation, bullpen. Um, but yeah, I'm not nothing set in stone and, and just gonna give him an opportunity to make the team. Next up, Dan Connolly. Hey Brandon, yesterday you kind of mentioned when you were talking about Felix Hernandez as a potential Hall of Fame guy. Today he talked about um, you know, kind of wanting to come back and, and build up those numbers uh, in one sense, you know, for the Hall of Fame. I guess it's a two-part question for you. First of all, do you see him as a potential Hall of Famer and, you know, in, in your experience on, on what you've seen so far in his career? And secondly, what do you think about him will make him to be a, a mentor about his personality and such that could be able to bleed into some of your younger guys? I don't remember talking about that yesterday, to be honest with you. But, um, you know, I haven't even looked at his career numbers. So I, I don't know what I do know that I think I was with the, we were with the Marlins and it was uh, 2010 or 11 went and played Seattle and and there was a different it was a different level when when he was on the mound um, sold out ballpark the King's Court I think it's the, it was the King's Court um, with the yellow signs and and I think he punched out about 15 guys on our on our team it was one of the more dominating performances I've seen so. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what his career numbers. I know he's had a great career and, uh, he was so dominant, especially the first half of, uh, in the first five or six years. Um, and it was a show every time he was on the mound, just because of, it was no hit stuff. And, um, yeah, just giving him an opportunity as well. Veteran guy bringing in and, and, uh, see what he can do. Kind of to follow up. First of all, I think it was Mike that had said that a couple of days ago. So I just improved your uh, standing in the organization. Um, one other question to, to kind of finish up on that is what what do you think is, could make him a mentor uh, to these young guys? Well, I think when you've had that much success, you've had that many innings on the mound in, in the big leagues, you know, a lot of our – we don't have guys that have a ton of service time. And, and uh, someone like him that – has thrown a no hitter in the big leagues and has, um, you know, pitched in the environments that he's pitched in, uh, and just been a really dominant starter, especially the first half of his career. I think that there's always things to learn from um, if you're a younger player from a guy like that. And so I'm excited that our guy, younger younger guys, can rub elbows with somebody that that has had a lot of success in this game. Next up, John Mioli. Brandon, in years past, guys have been at this point in spring on kind of like an every other day bullpen routine. Is there, given this is the second day of workouts, is there anyone who's there who hasn't, for health reasons or any other reasons, been able to take their schedule bullpen so far? No. Everybody's been on schedule. So fully healthy? Yep. Cruise, cruise yeah, we had half our guys throw bullpens yesterday and the other half through today. Charles. Rich Dubroff, go ahead. <laughs> hey, uh, Br uh, Brandon, I know that uh, position players don't report till this weekend, but with uh, Jemai, Jemai Jones, uh, are you looking at him as as basically just a second baseman, or are you going to try and work him in the outfield dur during the spring too? Yeah, I think you're going to see him do a little bit of both. I think the I'd like to see him a lot at second. I think that's going to be the – the main focus, but we know he can play the outfield. And, and uh, so I think that, you know, his primary position, this this camp will be second base, but you'll see him in the outfield as well. Excited to have him. Um, talk to some Angels coaches, a lot of guys I know over there, and they rave about how athletic he is and how much better he got defensively, especially at second base last year. So excited to get him into camp, and I've never seen him. So it's, uh, it's going to be a fun guy to watch. Nathan Ruiz. Hey, Brandon, you guys carried three catchers for a lot of last year. I know the roster configuration is a little different this season, but is that something that uh, you'd like to consider doing? I know it's still very early in this process, but is that something that you think is a possibility? I think the 28-man roster definitely helped with that. Uh, if we care, no, I'm not sure. Yeah, the answer to that is I'm not sure. I have no idea what our roster is going to look like this early and 
I th it's always a luxury to have three catchers on your roster. Um, that's that's a huge thing for, you know, especially um, when you know right left and you're able to pinch hit for a guy and have a have a third guy that possibly could play other positions. Also, it's very very helpful. Um, but yeah, with the with the limited roster this year and and. Let's see, let's see how our pitching lines up and how many guys we carry on the mound, et cetera. I think that it's just too early to answer that. Stan Charles. Brandon, uh, just a question about your bullpen. In an ideal situation, would you like to have one guy emerge as the quote-unquote closer, or would you rather just be able to, to mix and match when you need to? That's a good question. I think that uh, ideally uh, you'd like to have roles defined. Um, I think that we have guys that are able to pitch in the ninth inning. I'm looking for guys to be able to pitch in the ninth inning and then we'll go from there. Um, but yeah, if, when, you're, when you have a, a Roldis Chapman or Mariano Rivera, uh, those type of guys, yeah, you want them to pitch the ninth inning and that's their role. Um, we're just not there yet. So as of right now, the ninth inning is is wide open, um, and we'll we'll do the best we can, and we'll see what we have. We'll see who who can handle that that situation and who we feel like is the best matchup. Um, whoever we're going to face that in the ninth, but yeah, in an ideal an ideal world, you you have um, a lights out closer that, that when you give the ball to in the ninth inning, um, you got a high ch high percent chance of winning the game. David Lorilla, go ahead. Hey, Brandon, you were asked yesterday about playoff projections, and you understandably aren't going to be concerned with those. But what about player projections? Can they be helpful in assessing just how a player is performing over the course of the season? In other words, are they basically a baseline when you're evaluating? I think we evaluate. There's a lot of things we evaluate when we're evaluating a player from numbers to um, improvement we see making as, as coaches, um, yeah, I think there's, we're always, we're always evaluating our players in, in every, in every way. And that's a, that's a daily conversation that happens in the coach's room, a daily conversation that happens with, with, with Mike, um, and talking about our players. So, um, I, I'm not, I don't really understand the question very well, but I think that, that you're at, the bottom line is we're, we're constantly talking about our players and, and we're going to evaluate them, um, in every way possible. Yeah, to, I guess to make it more clear, uh, you know, just say any certain player, maybe a young player, the projection system suggests, you know, that maybe he's going to have a, a certain slash line, you know, based on historical precedent and his profile. Will you look at that, say, in the course of June and say, hey, he's doing better or worse than we thought he would? Yeah, I think we look at projections, but also projections don't, uh, it's not the end all be all. And I think that there's, there's, uh, you know, you want to, you give, give guys a player plan. You want to see improvement in players, um, in every aspect, from on the mound to, to position players. Also, from a standpoint of, I'd like to see him hit with more power, I'd like to see him um, draw more walks, etc. Um, that might be a goal that you have going into the season, and, and then you kind of reevaluate as, as the season goes along. Follow-up question from John Mioli. John, go ahead. Brandon, given the protocol's unique circumstances, have position players been allowed to report? Are they able to be there working out during this period and doing what they normally would if they wanted to show up early? Yeah, we've got uh, Trey's here. Trey, uh, DJ Stewart, um, and Wilkerson. They're all here, and they just won the bat today on the field. Steve How does Trey look? Oh, sorry. Uh, Go ahead, John. As a follow-up, how does Trey look? Looks really good. Yeah. Feels great. And um, driving the baseball today on the field, took ground balls, um, done, did that yesterday and today. And uh, it feels fantastic. Steve, go ahead. Brandon, maybe it's not a correct assumption, but I think a lot of people looking at your team would assume – Steve, you muted yourself. No, that, that was me. Sorry, Steve. I'll unmute oh. you real quick. That was an accident. Oh. That would have been a first mute myself. 
lot, a lot of people have wanted when I'm asking to mute. when I'm answering a question poorly, I'm just to start doing that. A lot of people have wanted to mute me over the years, so somebody <laughs> finally did it. So a lot of people would assume, Brandon, I don't know if it's right that Yomer Sanchez might have the lead at second, Freddie at short, Rio at third. Is that how you see it today? Is it wide open? How do you characterize some of these infield spots? Yeah, I think we brought Freddie in here to, to be our shortstop. Um, you know, Yomer's got a lot of experience at second base, won a gold glove. So I think that there's um, brought him in to, to play a lot. Um, I could see him playing second base. And, and Rio was, uh, it's been part of our infield of the past couple of years. And, and uh, also looking forward to seeing him get a lot of at-bats this, this season also. So I, I think it's safe to assume that the three guys that, um, you know, two guys that we brought in, we want, we want like to have see them play up the middle, and and Rio's going to get every opportunity to win win a third base job again. We've got time for one quick follow up from Stan Charles. Stan, go ahead. Brandon, I was going to ask you about Freddie Galvez. Uh, I mean, I've seen him play a little bit, but not for any great length of time. What do you think we can expect as an overall player here? What does he bring to the table? Just re really solid, really steady. Saw him play in Philly when he first came up and then Toronto a couple of years ago when he was uh, in, in our division. Um, just a very, very solid, steady player. Uh, he's going to make the routine play. He's going he's gonna to drive some balls out of the ballpark. He's got some raw power. Um, but just a, a, a guy that's played in the middle of the field in a lot of games in the big leagues and has a up-the-middle experience, which you, look at him and Yomer, they both have up-the-middle experience. Do you think he can have some of the same leadership uh, intangibles that uh, Jose had last year? I, I think that's, I definitely think that's possible. Everything that I hear, um, I don't know him very well. I've talked to him on the phone. Looking forward to meeting him um, when he gets here. But Cincinnati people rave about him. Talked with, with people that, that have had him also in the past, and they, they think he's a, a really good clubhouse guy and uh, a nice leader by example. So I think he has a lot of those qualities. All right, that's all the questions we have today. Thanks so much for joining us, Brandon, and we will see everyone tomorrow. about the Orioles that convinced you that they were the right fit for you? The opportunity. I think the opportunity that I got here, I mean, it's a lot of young guys and come over here and, you know, I didn't play last year at all. So to come over here and have the opportunity and they give me a chance to come over here and compete and get a spot on the rotation. So I think that's, that's what I made the decision. Next, we have a question from John Mioli with the Baltimore Sun. How's it going, Felix? Um, I'm wondering how you felt last year in spring training as you were pitching with the Braves and, and starting to ramp back up a year later after not pitching during the season. How, how's your arm feel? How do you feel like 
like your stuff is reacting so far? I uh, know I didn't play last year, but actually I prepared myself during the off season. I feel really good. My body feels good. My arms feel really, really good. So I'm just getting here, prepare and go out there and compete and do what I need to do to get a spot in the rotation. Uh, for anyone just joining, if you have a question for Felix, you can drop your name in the chat. Next, we'll go to Dan Connolly with The Athletic. Felix, you mentioned there's a lot of younger guys on this team. You were 19 when you debuted. You have a lot of experience. How much can you, you know, kind of give that to those guys? And how much are you going to kind of be that mentor, take that mentor role? I mean, I've been talking to the guys all the time. I mean, doing the PSP, doing uh, the drills that we do on the field. They ask a lot of questions, and I'm, I mean, open too. So it's uh, just to be a mentor and it's just to give you my perspective of the game and my experience. I mean, I'm having fun over here. Rich Dubroff, BaltimoreBaseball.com. Hey, Felix, how difficult have the last few years been for you? Uh, you know, the couple in Seattle and, and last year. Well, the couple in Seattle, because I wasn't healthy. I mean, I was doing a lot of injuries and I wasn't having fun. And last year, I, didn't, I mean, I opt out because of all the things going on in the war. But right now, I'm like really, really feel good and uh, I'm ready to go. Next, we'll go to Stan Charles with Press Box. Stan, go ahead. Hey, Felix, I'm wondering those injuries, have they forced you to have to change the way you approach pitching from being maybe a power, a predominantly power guy? Actually, to... not. Not because, because my velocity declined. About five years, four years ago, five years ago. I mean, the last two years, I, was, I wasn't healthy at all. But right now, I'm not, you know, the hard thrower that I was before. I'm just kind of like a smart pitcher. I mean, trying to go in the corners and mix with all my breaking balls. So, I mean, it don't make any difference, but you get to be a little bit smarter. Kevin Richardson, Baltimore Sun. Felix, uh, what are the goals you set out for yourself this season? Stay healthy. On the, that's the only goal for me. Next, we'll go to Steve Molesky. Felix, when you were having good results with the Braves last spring, what was going well? And do you feel that same will go well now, or will you need to see hitters to know that? I mean, that's a good question. I mean, I need to see hitters, but I feel really, I mean, really confident in what I feel right now. Um, I mean, the success that I have in spring training last year is because I was preparing myself, I mean, the offseason, and now I'm really, really prepared too. So I'm, I can't wait for the game to start. John Mioli, go ahead. Felix, you mentioned your evolution as a pitcher over the last few years. What kind of conversations have you had with the coaches on, on what you do well and what can best make you an effective pitcher for the Orioles this year? I mean, it's a lot of stuff. I mean, new stuff, like the rock soto. I mean, how do you throw, like, you know, how do you, you angles of your arm and everything. But actually, we don't talk that yet. I mean, I'm just, I throw my first open yesterday and I feel really good. And I mean, it's just to start. Dan Connolly, go ahead. Yeah, Felix, you obviously pitched well in the spring last year and then decided to opt out. Can you kind of talk us through why you opted out and in retrospect, you know, whether that was a good decision for you? Because I want to be healthy and I want to stay with my family. That was my decision. Go back to Stan Charles. Stan, go ahead. Felix, it's been a while since we've had a pitcher in Baltimore who's made the kind of money you've made in your career. I'm I wondering. Make, I don't make that kind of money this year. Yeah, I know that I'm not this year. That's what I wanted to know. So, what still drives Felix Hernandez at 35 to want to pitch? First of all, 34. 34. I apologize. Yeah. No, don't worry. Uh, the Hall of Fame. I think uh, I had a shot to go in the Hall of Fame, and uh, but I had I had a few numbers that I had to keep it up and uh, like wings and strikeouts. So if I get to those goals, uh, I think I'm going to be shot to the Hall of Fame. David Lorillo with Fangraphs. Go ahead. Hey, hey Felix. Uh, you're known for your for having a good changeup. Have health issues and declining velocity impacted uh, your usage of it and the way that maybe you grip or get action on it 
And do you uh, see no, that going sorry. forward? Sorry, keep going. No, and do you think that going forward, you're going to have exactly the same change up that you always have? I mean, I still had him, still got him. I mean, but it's the, it's the way you use it. I mean, I don't have the only change. I have curveball, has slider, has good sinker. So it's like how you approach hitters and how do you like mix all, all your pitches. But I don't think with the decline on my fastball, the change is still there. Right. So same change up you've always had. Yeah, but a little, little slower. Does does that matter? Uh, no, because it's got good section. All right, we've got one final question from, uh, oh, it looks like two quick final questions. First, we'll go to Joe Trezza with MLB.com. Yeah, F Felix, you mentioned the Hall of Fame. I'm, I'm curious, are there any specific uh, milestones that you feel like you need to reach or a certain amount of time you still need to play? To, Actually, I just said it. I just said it. I just said it like two questions ago. I would say the strikeouts and uh, wings. If I get to 250, I think, no, to 200, and like 3,000 strikeouts, I think I had a shot to Hall of Fame. Thank you. I that, had the numbers. Let me tell you something. I had the numbers because I had a, I got the innings, I got strikeouts. But I think my goal is to get to 3,000 and 200 wings. Thank you. And Jerry Coleman with 1057, do you have a question? I do. Uh, Felix, in terms of staying in shape uh, during your year off and getting back into that routine, I mean, it was only 60 games last year. So how do you have to control yourself in terms of not getting hurt and try and knock on wood to stay healthy so you can get to the regular season? I mean, it's the way I prepare myself during the off season. I mean, I was, I've been throwing a lot. I've been throwing my brother pretty much all year. Uh, and I was been in the gym all the time, so I think uh, I'd be fine. All right, I think that's all the questions we have. Thanks, Felix, for joining us. Oh, you're welcome, guys. And thanks, everyone, for jumping on. We'll be back at one with Chris Holt. Thanks, Felix. He's out. All right, we can go ahead and get started. Uh, we'll have Dan Connolly lead it off. Dan, go ahead. Hey, Chris. I was wondering, you know, we just talked to Felix Hernandez, and I was wondering, you know, in watching him, I know it's only been a day or two, but in watching him and getting a sense of his personality and stuff, what have you seen so far, both physically and kind of you know, the way he's handled himself? Yeah, number one, he, he knows who he is, and he knows what he has to do to get ready. And physically, he looks like he's in tremendous shape. 
His first bullpen was yesterday. Uh, delivery looks like he's on time and uh, pitches coming out of hand look uh, very true and, and he's been doing work at home. So it's uh, encouraging to see him come in and be ready to roll right from the outset. Next, we'll go to Rich Dubroff. Rich, go ahead. Hey, Chris. Uh, you know, a lot, has, a lot has been made in, in, in baseball these days that pitchers just throw as hard as they can, as long as they can. But you, you have two guys in camp, Cesar Valdez and Mickey Janis, who, who certainly don't subscribe to that. How open are you to having, you know, pitchers who, who are unconventional, who do very different things? Yeah, it's, it, I mean, the game has trended that direction. Arguably, Nolan Ryan threw as hard as he could for as long as he could and, and made a Hall of Fame career out of it. But um, it, it is nice to have a couple of guys that have to pitch and, you know, do some things that are I've always found to be the uh, fun part of the game when guys can pitch and, and mess with hitters timing and and do all the things that we maybe traditionally saw more of in the past, uh, especially when I was growing up watching the game. Um, you know, Cesar Valdez, uh, very solid mix with his changeup and can mess with hitters timing, very good with command. Um, uh, Frankie Abad, too, uh, another guy who's going to pitch and, and change speeds. And then Janice with his knuckleball, but has other pitches in his mix. Uh, we're very, uh, very excited to see them in camp. Steve Molesky, go ahead. Chris, uh, Brandon mentioned yesterday when asked about a six-man, we're open to it, all things under consideration at this point. Um, how serious would you characterize your interest in that, and what will be factors that go into whether you decide to do it or not? My interest level is to make sure that we take care of pitchers' health and win as many games as we can, and whatever we have to do to do that is the priority. So, I'm, again, I'm open to anything that we – feel is a, uh, a, a suitable uh, means to achieve those ends. Uh, as far as, what's the second half of your question? Well, it's, a, it's tied together, and I think you're answering it, just what goes into that. I mean, you, you know, guys who have been pitching for years on a five-day schedule, do you think about that, you know, disrupting schedules, or does health, health obviously maybe override everything? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, as we've learned in the last year, guys have been able to adapt and, and make, uh, you know, transitions to whatever is needed to navigate the intricacies of, of what we have to go through now with our schedule and meeting new challenges that, that we've all had to meet. So I, I chalk it up on, on that side of the fence with uh, making adjustments and, and disrupting work. I think we're not too worried about that as much as we're, we're more concerned with managing workload, managing rest and recovery time and doing the things that help guys stay on track and also sharpen their weapons between outings. John Mioli, go ahead. Chris, kind of to that point in trying to make sure that people who, you know, need to be protected in that sense are, are there on the flip side, are there guys who might have been relievers or had shorter stints last year who are going to be prepared as starters just so that you, or long men, just so you have those options at this point? Yeah, those things should sort themselves out. It would be irresponsible to to throw any names into that mix right now. We we know that um, we have the ability to, you know, have starting pitchers go for shorter stints, and we do have a handful of relievers who are capable of going two or two plus innings. And so those things should naturally sort themselves out as we go, and we continue to do buildups and and be able to determine, you know, who is capable of doing what and sustaining it as we go throughout the season. That's going to be a big piece of sustainability. Nathan Ruiz, go ahead. Hey, Chris, what, what kind of benefit is it for you to have familiarity with these guys over the last couple of years? How is that helping you in this new role? Well, it, it makes it easier to have conversations that are just follow through on things that we've already been perhaps working on or things that we've you know, improved upon over the previous two years. Um, they know when they come and talk to me or Darren Holmes that we are invested in them and their careers and invested in helping them get the most out of their ability and letting them take the wheel. You know, we have no desire to, uh, to dominate anybody's life with anything that we see as, you know, our program. We have things that we're doing to help maximize each guy and we approach it that way. So they know when, when they have relationships with me and Darren Holmes that, you know, they know what they get. 
Stan Charles, go ahead. You just mentioned Darren Holmes, Chris. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how familiar you guys are with one another and how you see him as your sort of assistant pitching coach, if you will. He, he's been a tremendous uh, impact since he arrived uh, in 2020, even winter of 2019 when he first came on board. I mean, we spent a lot of time that winter on Zoom calls and just getting familiar. And, you know, he, he has the ability to, to really connect with players, other coaches. He's a, a tremendous person who is a very talented baseball coach. And he is a guy who, you know, we work – together and are on the same page so there's never there's never any uh, concern or anything about you know Nick's messages or any kind of noise for a player we're working always to be on the same page and and a shared message with all the players so couldn't be more grateful to uh, to have Darren Holmes here as the assistant pitching coach. Joe Treza go ahead. Hey Chris I want to ask you another question about the workloads especially uh, the way they pertain to sustainability, like you mentioned. Um, I feel like a lot of the conversation uh, in, in, in this lane kind of centers around guys who maybe threw 200 innings two years ago, and then they threw 50 last year and what that looks like for them going forward. But what about guys like Kramer and Aiken who threw, you know, less than 30 innings last year and, uh, you know, more than that the year before, but not maybe 150, 200. What does this part of spring look like for them from a preparation standpoint, and how is that different? Yeah, the, the big picture on this is that it's important to manage workload on a micro level so that we can sustain it across the macro level. And so when you look at all the innings totals and the numbers and, and things that are dealing with math, it can be a little bit noisy. Real, the reality is, is that we have to be able to manage their, their work and their recovery and their buildup between outings and then manage that workload over a longer period so that there's a steady, sustainable method to how they stay in rhythm and how they're able to basically get back to baseline recovery prior to next outing. So when all of a sudden you start having um, a spike in, in a certain game with a high pitch total or a spike in innings where now you really have to adjust for that in the ensuing games to not keep them redlining for a longer period of time. That makes sense to you guys. So it's gonna be a real time read and there's gonna to need to be a proactive approach to managing their workload based on what they have just done and what they will be looking to do in their next outings. So that process could be dynamic. It could change throughout the year based on what happens in games. It's, it's difficult to say that, a hard yes on that, Joe. It's, it's really, I'll give you an example. If, if a starting pitcher has been throwing a string of four or five inning games, it's going to be really difficult to let them go eight and 35, 45 pitches more on a given night and really spike that workload. It's not to say that it couldn't be done. It's just that if you do that, you need to adjust for it typically off the next outing. He's going to need more recovery and then you need to kind of stay in that wheelhouse. And so I'm trying to use an example there for you. It's, it's not as very easy to get concrete with this. And I know everybody wants hard answers. Um, again, it is going to require a proactive approach and that we monitor things on a micro and a macro level. We've got time for one or two more quick questions. First, we'll go to John Mioli. Chris, I'm sure you guys had them, you know, a little before, but the minor league schedules for, for AAA and then the rest of the, the levels were released today. So those are kind of set in stone now. What is having firm dates for when, you know, the prospects that you have there who are, who are likely ticketed for AAA and then the rest of the guys who aren't there yet, what is having firm dates for when things are going to start do for their preparation and what they're, you know, trying to do and required to do down there at camp? I mean, immediately you just – like what a breath of fresh air and a relief for those guys to have something to look forward to after being home most of the year last year. Um, how exciting that must be for them to know, hey, we're going to come in, we're going to be competing and, and working again and, and trying to get where we want to go in our careers. So, you know, big shout out to all of the players in our organization who now have something to look forward to and are ready to come in and rock and roll. 
Um, so that's the biggest thing in terms of having hard dates and, and having some, some clarity on that. Um, it's also really important too that you know, we have a framework to adjust from should anything else need to change. And we know that you know, with this entire scenario that things can and will change, but when we have you know, a, a firm plan and there's you know, seasons and, and we know we could have fans at some point, it's just what a relief to know that we could you know, see uh, some sense of normalcy with, uh, with the minor league season. All right, we've got time for one more quick question from Stan Charles. Stan, go ahead. Hey, Chris, uh, you've gotten to work a little bit with Hunter Harvey the past couple of years. Uh, are, are the problems he's had staying healthy, are they, do you see them as career limitation type of issues or do you think he can get past them? Well, it's tough to say. I mean, my medical training is limited and, and sort of comment on why he's been hurt, when he's been hurt, wouldn't be responsible. We are always working to improve the delivery so that we can improve their ability to pitch. And typically the things we do to improve how they pitch also carry over into sustainable movements that help them stay healthy. It's probably the best I can do for you in a straight up way on that one. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. That's all the time we have. Thanks so much for joining us, Chris. Thanks, guys. And uh, Media, I'm just going to keep this call running uh, so you can stay on and we'll have Brandon joining us shortly.